Um, so anyway, I got the interview. Uh, the person who was interviewing me in New York didn't know I was from Toronto. I didn't even tell him. All I did was book a time, took a flight, and I sat in the interview. And the first thing he's like, so, like, where did you come from? I'm like, Toronto. He's like, yeah, but, like, where in New York do you live? I said, Toronto. I took a flight for the interview. And right off the bat, the guy liked me, and I ended up getting a job on Wall Street. Hey, 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 thanks for listening in to the REC Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Jazz Takar, and sitting beside me co-hosting is Laura Elto-Stewart. Hey, Jazzy, what's up? What's up, girl? How you been? I'm good. I'm good. What a cool episode we did today. It was so much fun. Yes. Our guest. was. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks um, to Toronto Life, our city's biggest magazine. Uh, yeah, if you haven't seen this guy as of late, then yeah. you're sleeping under like a, a rock. Uh, socials and stuff because like that. Because it's on everyone's social page. I mean, everyone's talking about it. Yes. Um, all over, obviously, Toronto Life. Um, Mr. The, Sawhill Juggy. Yeah, his story about uh, being 32 years old and investing in 10 homes in Toronto. And we knew we had to have him. Yeah. Every, well, everyone knew we had to have him. For we were sure. getting a message like, you need to find this guy and have him on his show. Get him so on your, we and, did. And he was so cool. Like, I called him up and he was like, yeah, Jazz, like, let's do this. Um, very, very interesting discussion we had about how he went uh, from the age of 23 to now. It was actually just his birthday not too long ago. He's 33. His portfolio, his real estate investment portfolio is worth $10 million. It's so impressive. And what's actually like really impressive about the $10 million, because a lot of people, you you can do that. Yeah. Um, it's the fact that 50% of it is is equity like he has 50 percent equity right now like it, it's it's the the fact that he he did and 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 still implements the buy and hold strategy it was just music to all of our music ears, to right? all, it, made, it made all of us laugh but i think even more importantly like obviously we're in the real estate business we help people buy sell and invest in real estate so of course you know we can latch on to to that part of his story but I think even more fascinating and maybe it just resonated with me because I had sort of a similar experience myself where you know he went to school for something and, and he thought this is going to be my dream job and it's going to be super glamorous and I'm going to go work on Wall Street I'm going to do all these wonderful things and he spent a lot of time in school and just decided that that wasn't the right career choice for him. And, and I had a similar experience in that when I came out of school, mm -hmm. um, I have a degree in nutrition and now here I am sitting as a realtor. And there's a lot of people. It's when a little you, different. It's just, a tad, <laughs> just a tad different science degree to, to this. But, yeah. um, you know, there's always people in your life that are telling you, well, that those four years would have been a waste of time. And why are you changing careers? It doesn't make any sense. What do you mean you're going to start uh, interning for Holt Renfrew when you could go and get a job in nutrition? Like, well, there's all these naysayers all the time, and he had the exact same story, so I could really resonate with that. What did you do to kind of shut out the naysayers? I think it's easier when you're younger to kind of go with your gut okay. a little bit. There's just always no something. No pun intended, nutrition, like you, you gut. You know when you're like 15 years old and you're dating someone, and you're like, yeah, that's not going to be the guy I'm okay. going to end up with. And yeah. then you break up, and you don't think that much about it. You kind of just do it because you always just think, oh, I had, there's, there's so much time left. Right. But then there's this weird time in your life, maybe it's in your late 20s where, um, you know, early 30s, where you start thinking, well, I've already put so much effort and time into this. It would be a shame for me to – to waste it now. Right. Um, and I remember, you know, it was my fourth year university and I had already decided I still had one year left. I already knew I wasn't going to do a career in nutrition. I, I just decided I, I didn't have the right grades. And quite frankly, I wasn't having a whole lot of fun doing it, which I think just something in my gut was telling me. So I still finished it because I didn't think the time was wasted. Mm -hmm. I tried to take other learnings from it. So yeah, I don't work in nutrition, but is there something else that I that I took from it, and, and definitely, certainly communication and, and understanding and why people get into certain ruts and situations. I mean, I can take that and I can use that in any career. And just the discipline to uh, finish what you started. Yeah, and definitely. And then also going from the fact that, um, like you mentioned, that there's so many other things like teachings that you can take from, uh, you know, the relationships that you built. Exactly. Right. And you, you just kind of never know. And you say it all the time. It's, uh, you know, be open to opportunities and meeting new people. And, and you, you never know what's going to come your way. I mean, I, then I started working at Holt Renfrew. It was 2008. Well, guess what happened in 2008? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like at the end of that time, who was buying luxury goods? I was interning, hope, hoping yeah. to get a full-time job. Right. Um, and then they said, well, given everything that's happening, um, 
in the economy right now, we're we're going to just not hire anybody new. Right, obviously. So guess what? You know, I have a degree in nutrition. Then I went into go into real retail buying, and that wasn't seeming to work out very well either. But there's something about being young and tenacious, and you just kind of dust yourself off. But I think what, you know, what we can all take from this is hopefully, like, you need that skill and ability later on in life as well because sometimes things don't work out in your 30s things don't work out in your 40s or 50s yeah um it's not just something that we should you know think about when we're when we're younger it's you can always dust yourself off yeah. pick yourself back up and start over well i love the fact that you were it, it, it resonated with you i really hope this resonates with all of our listeners right across the continent this guy again saw hill uh, was 23 years old and just took action and it started off as his side hustle. Like, for a long time it for was a side For a very hustle. long time yeah. it was like he had full-time jobs yeah. he was at. Um, you know and, what else I got? Sorry, uh, I'm going to cut you off. No. Is how much time he spent researching. People, we always expect things to come easy and especially when it comes to something like real estate and investing, if you're going to be dropping that much money on something, you want to research. He said he, you know, he gave the advice of going to the town hall meetings and, and yeah. trying to get an understanding of sure. land development and what's going on. Like, don't leave it up to your realtor. Like, yes. do that stuff on your own, especially if you're going to start investing seriously. Well, I think the results and, and the proof is in the pudding, right? Because he took it so seriously, it's why he got the results. Right. Where you kind of, ha- you know, a lot of people half ass a lot of stuff. Yeah. Right. This guy didn't half ass anything, like especially when it came into came to his portfolio. He took it seriously. He met with contractors. He met with uh, went to, 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 to the town hall. He didn't even get a realtor involved at the start because he knew that it was going to be him and he was going to make sure that his results were based on his efforts. Yeah, and that, and that, again, something that we can all take in any industry, especially if you're looking to be an entrepreneur. You can't, like, yeah, you, you have time after work to do stuff, but you have to take it so seriously. It has You have to eat, breathe, and yep. sleep it. And it was kind of cool, too, because he was probably eating, like, ramen noodles, and, you know, he talked about... Yeah, you got to suffer a little bit to yeah, get what you right. want out of life. Guys, as always, uh, give us your feedback. Elto, thank you so much today. I appreciate it. Um And look, just take some action. Start with listening to this podcast, watching it. Um, And if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do so uh, on all podcast platforms and leave us your reviews and give us your feedback. And we can't hope like we just I, I can't wait to meet you guys face to face. And until then, enjoy the show. Bye, guys. REC Experience presents... Real Estate, Entrepreneurship, Leadership. With your host, Jazz Takar. The REC Experience Podcast is now on air. Well, thanks to our friends at Toronto Life, we were able to meet our our guest today, Sahil Juggi. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And obviously, to the left of you is a very familiar face and, more importantly, a familiar voice. Simeon, what's going on, brother? What's up, my man? Good afternoon. Yeah, I know you've been Welcome. busy. Nice to meet all you guys. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for doing this, man. You know, it, it's interesting because your article uh, uh, from Toronto Life uh, was brought to myself and my partner's, uh, Simeon's, attention by so many different sources. Right. And uh, it's kind of neat now to see what's happened with the podcast. Our, our listenership has grown to uh, over 150,000 people weekly Amazing. right across the continent. Amazing. And uh, it was interesting when I was reading down and just reading the article, um, obviously you're one of my paisans, and so I thought it'd be a good idea to, uh, uh, you know. Oh, change, God. Uh, you, you know how it is, <laughs> if you change it up a little bit. But as well as, uh, uh, you're a realtor. Yes. And I bring that up because, you know, a lot of people in this business, uh, and, and I had a couple of comments like, well, the guy's a realtor. Why do you want him on the podcast? Right. And it's like, whoa, it's, I, I kind of like that people say that and think that because it shows to how our right. uh, uh, thought process is, right? And I, I know I can speak for my partner. No as well, Right. As well as no you, doubt. like, yeah, we're all realtors and there's the pies are, like, there's enough pies out there. We can e- all enough, eat. Enough, man. Enough, yeah. You know what I mean? Sure, that, yeah. that we can all eat, but let's try to share and help, like, help each other and, and share each other's content and, and, and maybe, maybe, I know it's a, it's a big audacious, uh, audacious goal in that sense, but maybe we can also bring up 
the the industry from that perspective. Yeah, and it's right? all about these synergies, right? Like, and if you as a realtor don't understand your value and you're going to be threatened by other realtors, then you're just not doing good work. Right. And I never feel the same your way. Your like, value you know, prop. And you know, it's, it's the <laughs> same thing. Right. Like, I sit with real estate agents all the time. I meet with clients all the time. And it's not about that pitch that you give to, like, get steal a client. It's more like our work will met a lot of real estate agents that you can meet and it's, it's, they're doing different work and you're doing different work and the Eagle says it's enough to go around, right? As and long as you're hitting the right kind of target. And you just never know, right? Like, Simeon, how many times do we meet realtors and, and you, you pick up from a skill that they have and we use it and right. vice versa? It's But isn't that what life is exactly about? Just meeting people. But, but, We're talking off air us all of yeah. us, right? How about forever learning? Yeah. yeah. Kaizen. Kaizen all the way. It's never ending improvement. Why would I not pick something up from? So the minute you're not coachable, mm. the minute you stop learning is the day that you might as well just roll. Over. Well, if you're not growing, you're dying, roll right? Roll it's, it's one of those things, roll right? Um, roll over. Saul, I really want to get uh, our listeners and our viewers, uh, like we want to get your story out, man. It's really cool. It's interesting. It's different. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, Sahil in India. Like that, that's sure. where kind of this whole story started from, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, so, um, I born in Delhi, stayed yeah. there till I was 15 years old. Uh, my sister went to University of Waterloo and my parents at the time, you know, everybody in India has got the notion that you want to go to U.S., you want to go to London. But for some reason, my distant uh, family was here. My parents felt more comfortable sending me to Canada. Obviously, tuition was a bit cheaper to send for people to get out of India and go somewhere else. So Canada seemed like a good bet. For me, I, I mean, as a teenager, I was just excited to get out and go to Toronto and any country that's like, you know, outside of uh India, right? Sure. So I came here, um, went to high school for like about uh, two semesters. I uh, wanted to get into uh, a finance program. And I don't know why, but the dream was to become an investment banker. Where did that come from? Like, I it- honestly, I couldn't tell you. Maybe it was like a, some movie that I saw or something <laughs> yeah. and I heard the money yeah. was really good. Yeah. The, the whole like thing about working on Wall Street was supposed okay, to... Okay, that sounds was, cool. And I'm talking about 2000... Were you a fan of Wall Street, the movie, like back maybe, in the days? Maybe yeah, okay, I okay. really <laughs> can't tell you where from <laughs> yeah, the unconscious. Yeah. Like it was just... And I was good with numbers. Okay, right? there you so go. So English, English never attracted me or some like, you know, arts never attracted me. It was always about the numbers. I had a couple of uh, cousins growing up that were investment bankers and, you know, so it just the idea always resonated with me. Right. Um, so I well, went to a, Lord. It is a pretty stereotypical image of success. You know what? It was. Banker. Sure. It I really is. Well, you get the suit on and you're in Wall Street. The Ferrari. The- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. exactly. I don't know if it is today, but you're talking about 2003, 2004, yeah. when fin- before the crisis, right? Yes. The tech when bubble exactly. created that scene too, Exactly. Right? right before, so, like, when I was working on Wall Street, it was 2008. So at that time, the crisis hadn't happened. The bad perceptions never started coming in. Banks never went bankrupt. So at that time, investment banking was at its peak. So the glamour was attached to it. Sure. And that's where I got caught up, right? So I got caught up in the whole, like, I want to be an investment banker. And I didn't even care what it paid. It was just like, just the... Well, this was the dream. It was like kind of the passion, right? The the, the money didn't really matter at that time. I get it. Yeah. So anyways, eventually got into Laurier, got into the economics and finance program, met more people who were more obsessed and glamorized by the whole investment banking. So the dream was always to be an investment banker. (laughs) By the time I graduated, uh, I landed an amazing uh, interview with CIBC World Markets downtown Toronto. Okay. So I went there for the interview, got in, uh, had an amazing interview, was pretty confident I'm going to get the job. And then a day or two later, I got the call saying that I didn't get the job. And I was just in disbelief because my like my grades were good. Interview was absolutely you think fantastic. You crushed I was just, the interview. I was just like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> yeah. So I got in touch with the guy back and I said, look, like. So I, you followed up with the guy? I followed up. I, That's important for right. the young listeners, yeah. right? Like you don't see it often. I always tell the story about Clem, yeah, my yeah, videographer. Yeah. He, same thing. Like he sent in a resume and we probably got like 67 resumes and just about as we're about to make some phone calls yeah, yeah, yeah. he makes the follow up yeah, phone yeah. call and that's why he's here what up Shut but up. it wasn't even this, this the follow up it was just like I genuinely wanted to know why I didn't why I didn't get ele- like you know selected I sure. was just in disbelief it was yeah. more like a, an aggressive follow up it wasn't like hey I just want to know what can I can do to get better it was more like what the hell happened why did I not get directed <laughs> I, I like was just in awesome. disbelief yeah. right awesome. yeah. so I called the guy I said look I thought we had a great chat I mean, Everything went really well. What exactly happened? And it's not even the fact, I don't even know what I could improve to get that job. Like I'm, so he's like, look, I really liked you. Unfortunately, there was a lot of applications. We decided to go some other way. I said, look, you're higher up in CIBC. CIBC is all of the world. I don't care if you send me to Saskatchewan. I don't care if you send me anywhere. I'm ready to work in investment banking. And I want to work with CIBC. Tell me who I can talk to. 
And out of nowhere, Does he Benjamin says, Tall know this guy? <laughs> yeah, I know so, the senior so, economist there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, the guy got in touch with uh, some. He said, "Look, I do know some people who sit in the New York office, and they're okay. they're always looking to hire young people." I said, "Done. Just get me an interview." At that time, was was CIBC big in New York? Like, were they, were, were so they... CIBC doesn't exist anymore. Now it's Oppenheimer. Okay. At the time, they were a boutique firm, got and it. they were dealing with like mid or small sizes. They were Mellon back then. Yeah, right? exactly. So yeah. equity capital markets. We were uh, like helping people with IPOs and stuff like that. So they were. They were big. TD's now the biggest bank sure. in 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 US, but CIBC at the time was doing good business there. They had a good foothold. Um, so anyway, I got the interview. Uh, the person who was interviewing me in New York didn't know I was from Toronto. I didn't even tell him. All I had to do was book a time, took a flight, and I sat in the interview. And the first thing he's like, "So, like, where did you come from?" I'm like. Toronto. He's like, yeah, but like, where in New York do you live? I said, Toronto. I took a flight for the interview, and right off the bat, the guy liked me, and I ended up getting a job on Wall Street, which is kind of better than working in Bay Street for some sure. reason. It's a bit, there's a difference. Yeah. yeah. Fast forward another year, year or so, and I started realizing this wasn't my calling. Uh, I mean, the whole nine to nine idea didn't work. You know, I have to say right. nine to five, and it's Wall Street, it's actually eight to nine. Yeah, yeah. Right? Eight yeah. in the morning to nine in the night. I was busting my ass. Uh, just, it just didn't fall in place with me just I, I could just tell like the whole suit and tie idea you feel it in your gut don't you suit and I, I just felt like I was just getting sucked more and more into the fact that hey I put so much work into my education uh, this is a great job people kill for a job like this it, but it it's just, the biggest reason people settle I just the prior not, commitment you're already bought yeah. in you're like do I throw all this work away exactly. it's one of the biggest regret creators exactly once so, you, you just, once went, you get went, into I went, it, I went five, five years of school. Yeah. This did my master's. Exactly, my parents, paid, my parents paid for it. My parents paid for it. I think that's a big. That's feel, a big. I feel like other people's in my opinion. case, I got a loan. My parents right. didn't pay for it. But, but, yeah. but even and without that was a loan, a factor. Yeah. Yeah. But now you invest into a loan. Exactly. Are you betraying your own? You're stuck. You're stuck. It's, it's huge. Good anyway, on you. Go so on. I, I, I kept like, you know, I just every day that passed, I was just like, this is not something I want to do. A part of me really missed my friends in university. I have okay. some really close friends. Right. I and they're said, all here in Toronto. Yeah, everybody's yeah. here. And, you know, the, the, the best thing is everybody would call you and be like, man, you have the best life. You're working in Wall Street. I wish I could get your job. But in my head, I'm like, man, I miss Toronto. I wish I could just be there. And then one fine day, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I decided I'm going to go back and I'm going to make sure I get a job that's not a desk job. And right. that's it. I don't care if I'm taking a hit. And at the time, salaries were pretty good in, in, in Wall Street. Right? So within a year, I could pay my loan off. And I had no life because I was working 15 hours right, a day. Right, so right. I saved Classic. everything I made. I was sharing a small room with like four other students. So, you know, in Manhattan, you can't pay rent like that. <laughs> sure. So I was living in a, in, a, in a shithole in Manhattan. And just I just wanted to get up and leave. And the idea was I'm not going back to finance. Right. And I'm going to apply to every job that doesn't require you to be behind a desk. Okay, right? so what did you do? Well, what so I decided, of the, what's a couple, couple of the jobs that you right, applied so for? so I applied to uh, confectionery firms like Nestle, Hershey's, um, like, you know, Red Bull. That you can be out and about. Exactly. Got you it, You okay. want to be a salesperson. Yeah. I want to be meeting people. I yeah. want to be getting out there. You sure. Know, I heard that they give you a car, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I ended up getting a job with Nestle. Okay. Uh, I started becoming their uh, convenience store manager. So I was like, I had a territory, which was North York at the time. Okay. So I came back, with decent amount of savings from New York in a year and a half. I got a good bonus. Did well for whatever. They were pretty happy when they like, you know what, if you ever want to come back, doors are always open and mm -hmm. whatnot. So I started working for Nestle, um, got a free car, and you know, like I was just like super liking the job. I was like meeting new people every day, and I realized how much I love sales and the whole thing. Right now, and you're living the dream. But, but the now dream. you're also surrounded by in business for sell. Who right. are yeah. Nestle's customers? Yes. I don't care if he owns a little convenience store. Right. You speak to a dry cleaner. I was just happy to be out. <laughs> no, no, but like I spoke to my dry cleaner. My dry cleaner owns fourteen or sixteen. Yeah. It's an empire at that point. Yeah, well, I'm managing yeah. over but 400. People have a, but people make assumptions. Exactly. Yeah. Speak to the guy behind 7-Eleven. Yeah. You're going to find out that there's three compounds. There's a Mercedes parked in the back alley. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and two more in the garage. Exactly. <laughs> but, but people make assumptions. I and went and got a haircut. Yeah. I went and got a haircut uh, last week, two weeks ago. <laughs> okay? And I'm supposed to have an appointment. I think the guy's name was Anthony or something. I can't remember. I'm running like five minutes late. I give him a call and say, listen, I'm running late. Um, I'm not going to be able to uh, make it on time. He goes, ah, my next guy's coming in and you're gonna be working with someone else. And as the viewers can see, like my fades are fresh, okay? When I get them, like you can't see it now, but they're quite fresh, so, but I need Because you're not fresh right now. Yeah. That's um, so I go there, I go to the shop, and uh, the, 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 the receptionist at the front says, you're gonna be working with uh, Emilio, I believe his name is. And I look over and I say, okay, great, let's, let's get a haircut. I'm starting to talk to this guy. He happens to own 14 of them. I just ended up getting the owner. 
Right, but you just never know who you're gonna bump exactly. into. The guy has 14 you shots. You do a quick plug on prejudice and uh, how every loser out there has so much to lose further <laughs> yeah, yeah. unless they open their mother <laughs> sucking eyes yeah, 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 so yeah. to the reality so of so like, you're no better than nobody. That's so true. Take that job and yeah, get that exactly. free car yes. as opposed to thinking you're above it. Like you came back for a base, you could have been Honestly, uh, I was. Uh, you could have been the the regular loser yeah. who looks down on people, yeah. who thinks you earned something or you deserve yeah. something. No, man. But you could tell, right? With you, Sahel, I, it's a great point that you made, Simeon. Because with you, you could tell you you lived in you know the shithole in Manhattan. Yeah. You, it didn't matter to you. You you were you were going to eat the ramen noodles. Exactly. And it didn't matter. It didn't. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. you just had a bigger picture for you. Exactly. So now you're working in Nestle. So I started. Uh, you're meeting some people. Yeah, I started working with Nestle. Love what I did. Uh, I had a bit of savings and the right. Like I've always been attracted towards real estate. Like I know, like I've heard stories back in the day. I don't know if in, in Delhi you, you hear stories like if your grandfather had bought this, the value of that would have been this today. <laughs> if your father had bought this, the value of that would have been. So I come from that kind of family where, right. where you know my uncle's so own. So everybody man and, at this table right now comes precisely from yeah, that family. Yeah. Yeah. And when you know that, yeah. the, automatically as an adult who's starting to make money, the first thing is like you know I got to find a one bedroom for myself. I don't want to pay rent anymore. I didn't like dealing with my dad anymore. So it was more like an accident how I started looking into real estate. Usually how it works right? out, right? Yeah. I was happy doing what I was doing. Yeah. And, you know, I was out and about. I was doing exactly what I wanted to do, which is yeah. sales. So right? when you were a kid, you weren't. You, you, when the teacher asked you what you want to do, it wasn't like, I want to be a real estate agent. Exactly. Right? Like, I don't no. think anyone not, wakes not up and close. says, right? Not even yeah, close. Yeah, obviously, yeah. Um, so at the time, and and so this was like around 2009, we're in 2009 now, so I was, I was 23 years old and just, you know, loving life and everything's great. Uh, started looking into one bedrooms and, you know, I, my nature is that I started getting into things a little, I start obsessing about it, like I'll start looking into prices. Started talking to some real estate agents, realized right away there's not a lot of knowledge in real estate agents that I could, I'm not trying to be cocky in the sense that a lot of real estate agents were only throwing stuff on MLS to me and it was like buy this, buy that, there was not much reasoning behind it. Okay. So I started doing a lot more of my personal research. I was finding myself like, you know, uh, again, I had a free car so I started driving around at night just trying to s understand what Young and Shepherd was doing at the time, right? Right. This was my territory. I was living there in a basement and I was just looking for a one bedroom that at the time was listed for a 360, 380 or something like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Young and Shepherd was pretty expensive. Sure. Just for our out of province listeners, uh, Young and Shepherd, uh, Shepherd is uh, classified really as North Toronto. Exactly, um, it's like so North York. The, yeah. no, exactly, right North York. Yeah. So continue. Then I started realizing that the detached homes right behind where the buildings are on Young Street mm -hmm. are at the time was like 500,000, mm -hmm. 480,000. Like behind yeah. Harrison Gardens, exactly. behind the- So what, like automatically the light bulb went on is like, look, I can own land I can own a big like land piece of land, fifty foot lot in a small bungalow for five hundred thousand, and I'm paying about three hundred eighty thousand for a condo. Mm -hmm. Why don't I just talk to a few people and see if they want to like combine? Like I only have about sixty thousand saved up, and I ended up partnering with one of my distant uncles, and I gave the whole sales pitch to him. I said, "Look, like this uncle, this property is going to increase. I'll manage it. I live in the basement. I'll fix it up if I have to." But I'll just go and live in the basement. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure everyone caught that. Write that down. Yeah, write and that down. And you don't even want me to like get into how that basement was. Right? Like, I, <laughs> well, I read in the article, oh, right? Yeah. Was, or maybe we should. Then while there's, I had no furniture. Yeah, because that's I had the whole a, a point. A table, a chair, mm -hmm. and a and a mattress at the time, right? So we bought that house for five hundred fifteen thousand. Okay. House on Churchill Avenue. Okay. Right, right off of Park Home. Anyway, mm -hmm. moved into the basement, rented out the upstairs, which was almost enough to cover our. Uh, expenses. expenses and mm -hmm. I was paying a little bit towards rent five six hundred bucks and uh, yeah and that's how it started and um, just if you fast forward from 2010 I actually ended up selling that property in 2016 for 1.6 million dollars without putting a dollar into it after so, so 11 rent, years rented for six years <laughs> yeah no six years so, so 2010 six years, I bought 10, it you bought it in 10 and then so 2000 yeah okay. 16 yep so 2010 onwards, my interest in real estate started growing because prices I could tell, like, you know, I started looking at the macro picture. I started looking at, hey, Toronto, why Toronto in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Uh, immigration is at all time high. It's coming up to be one of the best cities in the world to live in. Political stability, healthcare sector. You have uh, education. Education. Even for an entrepreneur to be at that time, take loans against real estate for 2.6%. Do you know what loans you get? At what interest rate you get back home? Eleven percent, twelve percent. Yeah, I know. So when yeah. somebody says, "I'm going to give you a loan for two and a half percent by putting twenty percent down," that to me, is, from a finance background person, if you tell somebody who's got an investment bank banking background, is like, 
this is amazing, right? Well, I mean, and I could definitely see that appreciation coming year over year. I could, I knew, knew in my gut, gap between condos and detached homes is too small. Right. It's got to increase because yep. you're talking about land here. Yeah, exactly. And other factors that I started. So, so that schism into. is is significant now. So, so, so now, Almost now a the, difference. That's right. So the average price in Toronto today, like just because we did the stats mm -hmm. yesterday, is at what five fifty four. Yeah. For, for the average condo in the city of Toronto, we're not doing micro markets, yeah. mm -hmm. but where the average price for a detached is still one point two or yep. one point one. Yeah. So the schism yeah. now, when you were talking three fifty or three eighty to five hundred versus five fifty to one point one one point two, the gap, of course the gap widened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, why which why condos right now are obviously the starter home. The, the fastest growing asset and it's going to grow further. Yeah. It's, it's accelerated. It's done. From an yeah, investment yeah. perspective, the fundamentals are still the same. Exactly. The fundamentals are still the same. So now we're in 2000. Uh, 2010 in, still. So still. I, at that time, I'm still like, you know, I'm uh, Y Young and Shepherd. So first it's Y Toronto. Then I narrowed down Y Young and yeah. Shepherd. I, well, I like that you went, you know, they, they say yeah, which like is I, the niches And for me, it's right? not even just that. It's about which street, what is it facing, what kind of bungalow, what kind of lot size. Everything is just like I kept reading and talking to people. Like on a weekly basis, I was meeting three to five people and I, I would just call random contractors. I would call framing guys. And right. like, do you want to sit with me and have a coffee with you? Just sit, stand on their construction sites, bring them a coffee, just to pick their brain. Like how many people are hiring you for these jobs? Like what's going on in Young and Shepherd? I could tell right away that Young and Shepherd was great. And also at the time and still is, Toronto's transportation system still kind of sucks compared to big cities, right? <laughs> yeah, obviously. So yeah, it's embarrassing. Me, it's yeah. embarrassing. Yeah. So to me... If you're buying a property which is walking distance to the Finn station, amongst the many houses that, you know, you got to commute a long distance to even get to the subway, it made sense to put your money there. And that's when 2011 happened. And uh, by the 2011, believe it or not, that 515,000 was uh, about seven. It yeah. just took a big jump in 2010 right. to 2011. It started, you know, going 20% year over year. And um, I took out another eighty thousand dollars, and I um, and so I. So you refinanced it. I refinanced, and I saved a bit, and yep. I also had a little bit of savings. You didn't up. sell it at this point yet. No, 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 no. But that's very important because yeah. a lot wanted... of people see the dollars. Yeah. Right, and say, let me sell it and yeah. pocket the money. Yeah. They might go to Vegas and 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 do their thing over there and buy so some cars. It's also because they, they never think they have to buy again. Right. Yeah. Right? You're, you're buying laterally. My and simple rule is if you don't need to sell, don't sell. And and don't you guys find like we're as all we're all investors, right? We yeah. help thousands between the you know, at this table right now, there's thousands of investors we all have helped together. But we as investors, like at the end of the day, if you probably never really need to sell yeah. because you can refinance and pull out 80 cents on the dollar, yeah. generally speaking, you know, at any time once there's that equity, right? right. It's the short sightedness. Let me get that money yeah. now. Exactly. Right? The, the buy and hold across any asset of real estate is the long-term win. Yeah. You can call it many different names. Yeah. In commercial, you'll call it one thing. You can call it whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. You buy, you hold. Right. You buy, <laughs> again, keep in mind, you like, hold. You refinance, yeah. buy more properties for free yeah. with the, the market with pickup. Other yeah. people's money, right? Yeah. Like today, like, like <laughs> I've become a little bit more savvy. You guys are savvy. Sure. You guys understand. I try to push investors towards, hey, you got to have minimum 20%, minimum 35%. But keep in mind, sentiment was different in 2010. I agree. Like, there was more liquidity available. There was more was, uh, it, loan lending available. It was 100% bullish. But not to it, mention it, it at the time. Market. For a 24-year-old, if somebody said, hey, you're going to sell this and you're going to get $100,000 in profit, <laughs> it didn't. It did cross my mind. For sure right? it did. But I was like, look, I'm in it for the long run and I don't want to just sell. And what am I going to do with $100,000? I could do the same thing if I pull out some money right. and buy. So that's when I bought another property on Young & Shepherd, 100% on my own. Mm -hmm. um, what type of property was that? Again, detached okay, home, okay. fifty foot lot, yep. almost the exact same okay. looking property. So I like it. Now you're starting to kind of think of it as you know you're systematizing it, right? Yeah. Like, so you, my checklist includes small and two date I buy the same stuff. Okay. Small shitty bungalows on a big piece of lot, right? Close enough to the subway station. Yes. Fifteen to twenty minutes from downtown Toronto, and in areas that I can see that small builders are starting to come in, knock down those bungalows and buy. I gotta buy a bungalow in which thirty to forty percent of those houses have already been built. Okay. So I can see a trend coming. Yep. I can see that the small builders are coming in, taking out the bungalows and taking it out. And that was the whole point. And Maybe and we met in the past. <laughs> and we never in, knew it. In yeah. a past lifetime. It's exactly yeah. our, it's exactly our, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. for me, like, and again, I'm fast forwarding a year and year because obviously we have limited time, but I'm talking about six hours of, I would just go blank and I would be in front of a computer just looking on realtor.ca. I didn't have my license until then. Remember? Right. I didn't get my license until 2014. Okay. I was doing this purely without a real estate agent. And I was doing it purely on realtor.ca. And when I found something 
then I would go to a real estate agent and say, help me buy this. Well, you became a full-time investor, right? right? Like you took it seriously. Yeah. So, I mean, and the reason why I decided, and I, again, in 2012, I found a friend from university. I didn't want to stop. And I obviously money was an issue at the time to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have much money again. So I convinced a friend whose dad is into real estate mm -hmm. uh, in university. Mm -hmm. The guy had uh, built uh, some student housing and stuff back in Waterloo. So I get in, got in touch with him. I said, Andy, Young and Shepard's blowing up. It's already a 700K. I expect it's going to touch a million. Partnered up with him, bought the third property, also in Young and Shepard, exact same bungalow. That's 2012. Oh. Boom. Um, 2012 to 2014, I just sh shut the hell up and went back. And I was like, That's it. That's <laughs> yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I did invest in a pre-construction. Right. I said, now I can buy something. Maybe I, d I won't get a loan because the bank's going to tell me to get lost, but maybe I can buy a pre-construction that won't be ready for four years. Exactly. Because my hunger and appetite for real estate was still there, and that's the way I could just And like, now you're able to put your deposits down over exactly. a longer period of time. You Without don't have worrying to get about the financing. Loan. Yeah. That's Without probably, you know, that's, that's huge. So I bought my fourth condo pre-construction, Allen & Shepard, those Downsview condos. Again, oh, yeah. same concept, right opposite right, subway. Right next to subway, man. Two bedrooms. It's right by, I, 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 like, kind of close to Express, projects that we right. sold out of here. Yes, we yeah, did sell exactly. it on that project. <laughs> Liberty, <laughs> Liberty, like, it's yeah, there, yeah. Um, so now we're in 2014. Continue. Yeah. No, no, no. Go on, man. I want to hear more. So 2014. Yeah, so 2014 comes around. Now. I haven't bought real estate in a year and a half. I'm obviously starting to get itchy. and <laughs> <Chill> depressed. <whatnot. laughs> the pocket's going to So yeah. starting to like me. And, it my, and I'm still working for Nestle at this time. Right. And, but my... This was your side hustle. Hey, like hey, I, want I, haven't, I haven't bought real estate. Yeah, since. I know. <laughs> right, and, and you know what? The good thing is, by 2014, the properties I bought for 500, 600, and 700 are now a million. Obvious. So I know, I Delicious. know, I know. Realistically, I'm not going to be able to buy something in Young and Shepherd, and then obviously my obsession takes me to like other areas where sure. I can buy five to six hundred thousand dollar bungalows and small properties, and that's where Birchcliff and, and again, Cliff Press came maybe out. Maybe it's worth clarifying the reason you can't buy at a million now. It's not because you don't have equity or net worth or it's actually, it's based on income, but it's also based on income. Exactly. So putting 20% down and getting qualified for an $800,000 mortgage, if you're still at Nestle, even if you're making a couple hundred thousand a year, it's, it's irrelevant. You're not, you're not going to make it. Yeah. yeah. That, so you can't support all these properties and then get qualified for an 800K mortgage. That and that I didn't think at a million dollars I was recovering my cash flows. Yeah, yeah. your expenses. So if I put 20% down on a $700,000, I can still break even. The rents had to cut up. Because to date... I'll tell you one thing. It's my 13th property that I'm buying. I will never buy something that I know it's, I'm going to have to feed negative cash flow to. Right. It still doesn't, it, to me, it defeats the purpose of an investment. Right. It's got to break even. But see, that's important, Sahib, because neutral. the amount of times we speak with investors, and if it's not making them four or $500 a month, they stay away from it. I, it's unfortunate for them, fortunate for us, unfortunate for anyone listening or watching because like at the end of the day, the $400 a month that you're going to see so in positive, like, like yeah. what is it? It's like you, you're not going to get yeah. rich off Unless, of that. Especially, especially for the youngsters. On it. Especially for the young guys. You're going to spend it anyways, yeah. man. There's no long-term growth in there. Exactly. Right? Why not still? Because the reason I bring that up is because if it's not making them $400 a month, they don't buy it. Right. Yeah. Right, but I love that you said break even because if it's breaking even, it's doing its thing. Yeah. I like that you said you feel, you, you feel sorry for them because what's well, th unfortunate? Th those people, those people all come from the same school of thought. They either read the same book because they, they really believe that they've been like, taught that way. They've been taught that way, and it's wrong. Yeah. It's just wrong. Right, it's just wrong. You have to be open to you know, listen here people... and take from people's experience. Yeah. Like your story today. If this doesn't inspire and encourage a flurry of people, like this is 170,000 people are going to see this next week. Yep. Yeah. Like I expect the phones to ring mm -hmm. and say, how exactly did he do his analysis? Yes. What did he ask the contractor yes. when he was a young and shepherd? I am telling you right now, if this doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. Especially as a young person, like you were 23, dude. At the time I was 20, yeah, four, like, 25, closing in on 25, yeah. Yeah, but, but when you started and it, I, right? I, I like, want to mention one more thing. For sure. A lot, a lot of backlash from your friends, from your family, from people telling you, you're an idiot. You're going to take what me down, are down you a doing? weird path don't, don't right now, Don't take just down this <laughs> path. I'm not going to name, I'm not gonna name <laughs> I'm not going to name the people, but no. word for word, I remember that line in my head. Which was, what's our first, first, you quit Wall Street. Let me get this straight. First, you quit Wall Street. Then you get a sales job selling chocolates to convenience stores for $60,000 a year. Now you're buying property left, right, and center and like leveraging up. You're an idiot. So I was like, you know what? I think I've got a clear picture here. 
I, I'm and one of the things, you know, like I don't want to take away from the fact that a lot of people want to get into real estate, have families, have kids. At the time, my answer to me was, look, I don't have kids to feed, man. I can do this. I can take the risk and I can so I can be OK living in that basement and compromising every other aspect of my life because yeah. I can see. And it was so clear in front of me that yeah. that Toronto was headed towards greatness for the next five, six years. But you know what? Correct me if I'm wrong, man. And, and Simeon, please pipe in as well. I think with what I've just learned from, from listening to you, the type of person, even if you had kids to feed at that time, yeah. and if you were married, you would have figured out a different way. And what do I mean by that? That it would have been as easy as maybe you just venturing with more partners. Yeah. Right? Because it, I, you obviously understood it a long time ago. 50 cents is better than zero. Exactly. Right? I, I'm way too fucking passionate about this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We can so, talk all day. So, so the, the, no, problem, man, the, problem, the problem, problem is this. So like you, you, and you're going to take him down a weird path and we're laughing. Yeah. We've been surrounded by haters for s- longer than have I can remember. Have you seen remember. my Facebook comments on Toronto Life? I haven't yet. I'm going to go down. I'm going to take a look. I, I can only imagine. Man, right. people think it's easy. Pe- like you were saying earlier, he would have done it anyways. First of all, he was doing his homework. Yeah. Yeah. How many people do you know knocking on doors, calling up contractors, yeah. visiting the sites? Yeah. Nobody. Well, I love, the, I love the little point that I read in the article, right? Which where one? you were driving in the area to check the cars. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. It's one right? of those. Cool, I still man. do it. No, I still no, do it. But that's thinking. I don't buy a house unless I've thinking. seen what kind of neighbors are there and what for are they sure. doing and where the schools are going to kids. Right. Sorry, what schools what their kids the, are going to. Yeah, for sure. Anything. Where are they going to play their, you know, where are they going to play Frisbee? Like, I don't know. I just. I look at weird stuff <laughs> and I have a reason for it yeah, yeah, and I yeah. collect all the data and then I let my instincts deal like, then just at the time I don't waste time if something's coming But you're come not up, making decisions without data. Of course. Th- that's yeah. like that's yeah. our we drive this thing home we did a, a huge session here yesterday yeah. like Treb put out its annual publication. Right. Like, I saw that, yeah. Buddy, like if you don't think you need this publication, right. you got something coming to you. Like it's a breakdown where every mayor around the GTA is saying what they're planning for the year ahead. Like, if you don't Have read you what they're planning into, the year ahead... Step into the city hall. <laughs> go, go into zoning bylaw areas and just see what their long-term plan is. And I've done that more than 100 times, right? But I also so. like that as, as scary as it can be for some people, there's some very basic fundamentals. As, and I mentioned that earlier, that, look, there's a transit line, but there's not. All, it's not that vast in our city. See so where it's stuff. heading. Yeah. And and if if it's too expensive now at the Young and Shepherd area or downtown Toronto, where is it going? It's not hard to find. Believe me, real estate values because for the last hundred years they've done the same thing, like clockwork. They might have a little bit of a dip, as we know, but you know, up and down, upwards. That's the only yeah. thing with, that's going to happen. It, it, the fundamentals you know, are very making, easy to replicate. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll put this into perspective. Making a decision to buy a house or not to buy a house should not be based on the overall data that you see on paper. You got to go into the microeconomic, like just, yes. just get into the street and then pick, pick, like pick those properties like you pick an apple out of a bad basket. And those numbers won't matter because if the average price, like you said, is a million five or whatever it is, million one. there are still houses for 600 to 700,000 in Toronto. The oh, people are just like, hey, how is that possible? I said, B- except for the report that you read that says the average price is a million, <laughs> yeah. do you realize there's still amazing properties to buy at six, 700,000 but that can cover your cash flow at 20%. That can give you the exact same the, the checklist. The report from there. yesterday yeah. makes it very clear, for example, and I'm not quoting the report, but I'm just saying data. So, so the data yesterday will tell you that Toronto proper by June of this year is going to surpass the apex of the market of April 2017. Wow. That's fact. However, this is the GTA. So the guy in Richmond Hill who's facing 10 listings on his street that the market is down $250,000 from that apex be celebrating? The answer is no. You have a long way to recovery, probably another three to four to five years to get back to a plateau. Right. A bunch of you made the same mistake Amazing. and got a little too excited yeah. without doing your homework in the apex of 2017. Mm-hmm. You're not close to the sub, this, that, and it doesn't matter. But like, I'm just saying the data is out there. You told people, go to City Hall, knock on the door of planning and ask some questions. If I were to tell you that at Vaughn, what is it called? Vaughn Metropolitan Center, the yeah. new downtown. Yeah, Vaughn and Seven. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the, the, Seven and uh, Only because I'm a realtor. For, forget that I'm a realtor for a second. I'm an investor right now. Here's my investor hat. Mm-hmm. Because uh, 90% of our audience is in the States and the rest of Canada. So it doesn't matter. Right, yeah. right. So the whole point is, They've built three. They've sold three towers. They've built one. It's zoned for twenty towers. Where Centre Court is building Transit City, right? That whole neighborhood. 
do you think buying today is at entry level? You're like, or you think you're on the ground floor? I think so. Mm -hmm. By the time the 20th tower is built, do you think you would have made a significant spread right. from when you bought at T TC phase one? Right, <laughs> right. Like, right. I'm not looking it's to promote a project. Look, man, it's, it's basic. It, it really is basic fundamentals, right? What I also liked about what your strategy that you were doing, Salah, is, is that you, at one point you, you you said, you know what, it's time to diversify a little bit, yes. right? Because of y your options, when we're talking about going into like pre-construction condos, you kind of have your template that you like, you like the 50 foot bungalows and, and uh, by transit as well, but you veered off a little bit in terms of getting a pre-construction condo. Right. Because you- And I learned a lot of lessons from that. Like? like closing costs, development fees, <laughs> levies, what capping means. Like yeah. I didn't know anything, right? And can I, you assign it? Can you not so assign it? Can I, you rent it out? When yeah. I give advice to people and I tell them that I truly give you advice from the mistakes I've learned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nothing like a bag of nickels. In pre-construction, I learned a grand. lot of lessons. Yeah. So I was not happy with that. By yeah. the time I ended up paying so much closing costs, I had no idea where they came from. Right. Because no real estate agent will tell you. No fancy presentation centers where they're serving you coffee and have these like images. Sure. Be like, hey, by the way, do you remember the development fees? Yes. It's got to be capped. Yes. They don't tell you that. No. So luckily, Liberty is a good builder and they yeah. didn't end up charging me too much and whatnot. Got but it. lesson learned is that when you buy pre-construction, look past the marketing stuff, look yeah. past the upgraded uh, stuff that they show sure. you in their lobby and yeah. just ask them, what does the basics come with? Because that upgrades alone are like 10, 15 grand that a lot of people don't prepare for. And, 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 and we know as, invest about. as investors. Have you ever seen a basic condo versus an upgraded condo? <laughs> sure. like, the upsell is just unbelievable to me. <laughs> yeah. It's just like amazing. And we know that the attendants are not going to necessarily yeah, pay exactly. just because it has a little bit of exactly. a better actually, account or nobody actually cares. has nothing. To nothing. Do. Nothing. Yeah. nothing. Um, I'm going to mention your age. Is that okay? Because yeah, I know it's all over the article. You're 32 years old now. I just turned 33. Yeah. You just yeah, turned 33. Yeah. Well, happy belated birthday, thank I guess. You, thank you, yeah. When was it? September. Well, oh, okay, cool. Uh, the article uh, September what? Because it's my, my sixth. son's birthday. Sixth. sixth. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, the article was actually supposed to have come out in October, and they pushed it to February. So at that time, my age was 32. So it actually got published. It was 32. <laughs> oh, <got> it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just clearing that. <laughs> well, it actually makes sense now because you know Complete what? Complete disclosure. Yeah, yeah, I love I'm it. I'm not going to lie about my age. <laughs> so 33 years old now. Uh, been at this for 10 years. Right. What's your portfolio look like today? Um, Tell me in dollars, if you don't mind. It's about 10.6 million. And I have 50% loan to value. Fantastic. And that's something that I wanted to bring up is because it's the amount of equity that I've gained over time. Yes. My rule of thumb today as, as, as I become a more savvy investor is keep your entire portfolio as you pass the three, four houses to be 65%. Yeah. 65 is the magic number to me, mm -hmm. especially in an economy that Yes, they're saying that it's overloaded, household debt is a lot. You want to have some leeway. But at 50%, which means that I have 15% more to pull out yes. and buy more. So I, I want to talk about 65%. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The 65 so, so magic rule. I, I don't know, maybe because you were in economics uh, yeah. and, and you know a little bit more about it, but 65% for, for, for those uh, real estate investors who are in strictly residential income properties, you may not know this. But every single major uh, real estate fund uh, anything that is presented under an OM, uh, it, they're a lot more conservative. The number, the maximum, so for any real, you're not going to find a real estate investment trust that you can invest registered funds in that surpasses 65% 65% loan to value. So when a fund is buying properties, they're not going to leverage anything more than 65%. 65% is going to hedge you against the ups and downs exactly. of an everyday market. So when the market fell, it went down a total of 10% over two years. Now it's back up that, that same amount. But 10%, you have that cushion. there's a cushion. So and no matter what, you're not getting hurt. Yep. Your cash flow should be actually positive at 65%. It is. Yeah. Forget, forget neutral. After eight yeah. years, it is. After yeah. eight years, because you were <laughs> buying at 80%. Exactly. Yeah. But at 65%, you're yep. actually cash flow neutral. Yeah, and again, a big thing to do this whole thing is also the fact that rents have gone up, which really helps the cash flow of the property sure. you purchased a long time ago when your mortgages are low, right? Um, and that's not going to change in our city, in like, fact, not in the near future. We have know, way too many people coming in. I don't know if any of the policymakers or the regulators are watching your show or whatever, but there's one comment I love to make is that the whole point of them introducing these stress tests, interest rates, mortgage rules was to make housing more affordable. Mm -hmm. And here's how they didn't. They made it worse. When the property was, for example, hypothetically speaking, a property is worth five hundred thousand mm dollars, -hmm. and Jazz can own five hundred thousand dollars because his mortgage agent at the time has told him that you can afford up to five hundred thousand. That's mm -hmm. your purchase price. 
they put in these regulations and stuff, and they somehow managed to drop the price to, let's say, 400. That doesn't mean now Jazz can afford 400 because your affordability has dropped to 350. Yeah. So affordability actually got worse. And that's the only singular reason today that rents have gone up and the sale of condos are better. The Ontario Fair so people are like, plan, condos are doing really the well. The Ontario yeah. Fair ho- Housing exactly. Plan is directly mm-hmm. correlated to double-digit growth in rents in the city of Toronto. Exactly. Directly. So affordability yep. has gotten yep. worse because worse. of that. And that's the reason why condos are doing better, not because condos is better. Asset well, because it, our video is up. Yeah. Mine and your video yeah. is up on Facebook. Excuse mm-hmm. me. I'd love mm-hmm. to watch that, yeah. It, it's on... 15 days after this happened yep. or like I was outraged like I'm a very political person same here we're not even gonna get into that we don't generally go down that but round Ontario that. Fair yeah. Housing Plan when that came out I was so it's a disaster uh, but I was in disbelief yeah. I was like I know there was an election coming up Yeah. but I was like are people this stupid yeah it's like, horrible can you man. really put wool over people's yeah. eyes this badly yeah. but do you not see the disaster that yeah. you're creating and, and you know what it's not that hard to come up with a solution and here's why Singapore has faced the same problem. Tokyo has faced the same problem. Hong Kong has faced the same problem. Bombay has faced the same problem. A lot of countries have faced the problems of unaffordability of housing. What have they done to make certain changes and certain solutions that actually work? Where is the speculation tax? Where is the vacancy tax? Mm-mm. Where is the first time home buyer advantage? Well, they These are the things that are actually gonna help affordability. That's right. Not you starting to say, hey, whoever was supposed to like afford 500,000 now can only afford 350. Well, Meanwhile, the property is still 450. They, they, they haven't, they, they've always been touching the, the demand it's good for issues. Us, they haven't but been, I'm not never complaining that the there's no speculation issue. tax. I'm, uh-huh. I'm happy, I'm, yeah, I'm laughing, no, no. but. But they've also never addressed the supply. Exactly. Like that, that's something that they're going to have to some way, somehow address. And John Tory is looking into He's looking into it. And it's, and it's tough, right? With they the are. whole Greenbelt legislation, it's tough. Um, with that said, I always like to close these pod sessions with a tip sure. to our listeners and our viewers. Okay. As uh, our guest today, I'm going to start with you, Sahil. What's one tip, man, that, that, that you think, uh, you know, our listeners and our viewers should hear and see, man? Uh, to sum it up, I would say there's always a way. And if you have a good idea, there's always going to be money available. When there's a good idea, approach people with a similar mindset, with goals that are aligned as yours. Be like partnerships also shouldn't be done in a very rash way. Find a partner that has similar goals. Find another person who has forty to fifty thousand dollars saved, just like you. Get into a partnership, put it on paper, and execute. Don't let a good idea walk away and say I can't do it because there's always going to be someone else that will believe in that good idea with you and partner up. It's simple as that. A lot of businesses I love it. I love the, the, the simpler, the better, because right. it's easy to replicate. Right. Right. And so I love that, Simeon, my friend. I'm coming off some really data heavy days. Mm-hmm. I'm going to stick with uh, everything that I truly enjoyed from today's session is honestly the analytical approach that you took. Right. I'm not saying everybody's analytical, but if you're going to be getting into real estate, whether it's even if it's your primary residence, if you're investing, it doesn't matter. Get the data Mm -hmm. that you need. If it's hard for you to get the data, there is more than enough professionals, real professionals for you to going back to building your all-star team. And network, talk to people. Surround yourself with people who have done it. Like blow up our phones after this right. conversation. Yeah. yeah, you'd be silly not to. Yeah, and I, I have nothing to gain from a guy calling from Saskatchewan. But if you're from Saskatchewan right now listening, yeah, blow up our phones, blow yeah. up our our texts, our yes. DMs, yes. ask questions and get her done. But like the data is there. Do your homework. Make the right moves. You're gonna have the right results a hundred percent of the time. I period. love it. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. My tip today for the viewers and the listeners is is get real, real quiet in here. Shut out the noise. Don't listen to other people's opinions. Feel it in your gut and take action. Sahil, my friend, thank you so yeah, much for doing this. Yeah. We're going to make sure that we put up everything, uh, 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 all your social handles, sure. your numbers and your Appreciate websites it. and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Uh, 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 get at our boy Sahil now. Uh, we're going to become all three of us very close very <laughs> soon. Um, it's just because, you know, networking and all that's just what we do. Simeon, thank you so much for Cheers, us, always for joining us, guys. Yeah. guys. And yeah. to our listeners, I know you guys are, are, are listening and watching. But not all of you have subscribed. Press that red button. Take care, guys. Thanks. This has been the REC Experience Podcast with Jazz Takar, an REC Canada production. 
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the REC experience. Please make sure to subscribe, like, and share. Click here to watch and experience more videos from REC.